Okay. Chapter 16, Prices. Yep. We're in mid-May 2019. Mm -hmm. We're in the Human Action Study Guide by Robert Murphy. And uh, I don't know, do you have the questions open? Yep. Uh, 143. We're looking for it. Perfect. Thank you. So this was a really big chapter. I'm glad we broke it up. We'll break it up into three pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good strategy. It's like, it's a lot to take in all at once. Yeah. And it's kind of confusing language sometimes. Mm -hmm. I definitely had to like listen to it twice. Yeah. Okay. So, one, the pricing process. What does every exchange imply with regard to value attached by each party? Uh, that each party values what they're getting more than what they're giving. Right. Implied. Mm -hmm. Or wouldn't happen. Why is the concept of perfect information useless for the explanation of prices? Hmm. I'd say because no one can have perfect information. Not everyone's got some subset of all the information. They don't have it all. Right. And even if you have information uh, about the current prices, it doesn't tell you about the future wants and needs of people. So there's like... Yeah, I think that's probably... Like, prices are information about the past. Right. The prices we know are yeah. information about the past. Right. The prices of today are, are likely, I think, predictions of the future value of a thing. Yeah. I like guess they're the current value. Past prices are just a tool. To use to predict future prices. Right. How is the inequality of people important for understanding of the market process? So, I'd say some people have a low time preference. <clears throat> they want something right away. Right. So they'll pay more. Yeah. In not just time preference, in like pretty much every dimension, people have different preferences. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the market is kind of the whole of everyone's preferences. Who are the driving forces of the market process? How do they interact? Customers and entrepreneurs. Yeah. I mean, even the, the entrepreneurs' uh, inputs, the raw materials and stuff come from customers of theirs. So I would say customers and entrepreneurs are all there is in the market, basically. Mm -hmm. How do they interact? Uh, the entrepreneur offers something, customer buys it or doesn't. Right, and then the entrepreneur adapt based on that. Right. Do entrepreneurs take into account final or equilibrium prices? I would say no. I mean, maybe they take them into account, but they are looking at the, the not equilibrium part of the price. They're like, oh, that thing is way undervalued. I'm going to buy it. Yeah. What is a final or equilibrium price? I think it would, it's the um, fictional invented um, price that the world arrives at after everyone has perfect information and everyone makes all the trades that they want and like the world is in homeostasis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so definitely not. Yeah, it's, it's looking at the opposite of that, the, the highs and lows, the swings of, yeah. oh, this thing is really valued right now. Yeah, my favorite word from this chapter are profit seekers. Mm -hmm. It's like a great description for like what drives, I think maybe that's what drives the market. It's profit seeking. Ah, uh, right, right. <clears throat> yes. Comment, catalactics shows that entrepreneurial activities tend toward an abolition of price differences not caused by the costs of transportation and trade barriers. Right. Right, and that's like through arbitrage mm -hmm. and different things like that. Yeah. Oh, there's an inequality in this price. I can capture that spread. Let me go provide that value mm -hmm. till it 
that's all the way worked to nothing except transportation and trade barriers. So, two, valuation and appraisement. What is the ultimate source of the determination of prices? want to say it's the hmm. I think it would make more sense to talk about question two first and it's what's the difference between or what distinguishes appraisement from valuation and I found this interesting appraisement is um, what the market thinks the product will go for in the future mm -hmm. and valuation is you know more of how you personally value something. Right. So, I would say the ultimate source of determination of prices is the subject, the subjective values of the individual consumer. Right. And then, what distinguishes appraisement from valuation is the the first, the former is valuation. Uh huh. Because it, it uh, relates to an individual. But appraisement is the sum of all individuals in the market, therefore the, the market price. Right, so you'd use appraisement in catalectic or uh, economic calculation, and, but then when it goes time to sell, it, you need to find someone that values it at the price you're willing to sell it, regardless right. of what the appraisement is. Right. <laughs> yeah. Is the notion of a fair price scientific? No. Right. And there's no there's no rules to determine what's fair or not. Like who who writes those rules? <laughs> to say uh, what's fair. Individually, I guess. You're like, that's not a fair price for that item. Right. And then they're like, Yes it is. And okay, fine, five dollars off. Right. But then there, there is no price until the sale happens, so it's right. like, there is no price. Right. The prices of the goods of higher orders. In what way are the prices of the goods of the higher order determined by the goods of the first or lower order? So, the goods of a higher order have somewhat of a floor, because if you're combining two goods to create a, a higher order good, then that higher order good would yield more profit than what you could do get for those two lower order goods, right? So, like, let's say you're making some type of metal with silver and bronze. Mm-hmm. But then you combine this metal, yeah. these two metals, and it'll have to yield a metal that will uh, call for more money on the market than if you sold the, the silver and bronze individually. So which one in that example is the higher order good? So, wait, what's the metal called when you combine silver and gold? Maybe it's a better I don't know. Okay, so this third combination metal is the higher order good because you're melting silver and gold together to produce this higher order product. Hmm. So I'm confused as to which one is the higher order good. The higher order good is the one that are using the two lower ones to produce it. Okay. It goes from lowest is the factors of production to the higher which is the yeah. consumer well you have to combine these two elements of factors of production to produce the higher order good okay because the the first sentence in here maybe it's i need to reread it is the economist explains the prices of higher order goods i.e factors of production in the same way that he explains the prices of consumer goods 
i.e. by first explaining what motivates purchases and then by imagining what conditions would cause the market to cease. Maybe I have it backwards then. I think I had it confused as well according to this, but maybe th maybe it's a typo or something. Because it seems... I think, like, intuitively, I think a higher order good. You could just go higher and higher. You can't go lower and lower. Right. So I think that might be a typo. Maybe. On the contrary, the entrepreneur evaluates factors of production based on their appraisal uh, that these factors can create. Thus, subjective consumer valuations. Yeah, I think your point makes perfect sense. Yeah. So, yes, he, he, that is a typo because it says, which led to the formation of prices of the second, third, and higher order goods. Mm -hmm. Like, you could just keep, because then you could add that silver and gold thing to a ring, and then you could put that ring on a statue, and then you could, right. you know, like, you could do so many things yeah. like a statue in a building. Right, so there's a floor <laughs> for each order because if you can make more profit selling the silver and gold um, individually, then you do that. It's only when um, you think you can yield more profit combining them right. that you will go through the effort of producing. Right. Does the pricing process of higher order goods involve a connection of subjective values? Does the pricing process of higher order goods involve a connection of subjective values? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. The consumer must subjectively value um, the higher order good in order for it to be produced. Right. <clears throat> Which method do we owe to Gossen, Menger, and Bombar work? I do not know. It's, it's in the study guide. Oh, is it? Perhaps. I don't see it at first glance. Perhaps it's in the gray section. I'm afraid not. We will have to not know the answer for that one today. Why would it be absurd to speak of a sum of valuations or values? Because they are an internal thing without a scale. Um, they're not We can't measure if I value something and you value something. You can't you can't take those together because maybe you can't. They're not ordinal, I guess. Right. I would say that's that's probably it. Is that um, the way you value something is in relation to other things? Mainly myself. Yeah, and that's subjective. So like, I might value that guitar more than. Um, you know, this bottle of water, but you may value, I don't know, the, the scales of things don't, mm -hmm. I guess if we put it in money terms, it would be pretty clear. No, because how much then, you would say a thing, maybe I don't value money as much as you do. Mm, right. Yeah, never mind. Why don't the prices of the past influence future prices? Because conditions change. Mm -hmm. Things change uh, in terms of ability to produce things more cheaply, transport them, um, you know, their location can spring up in new th ways, tastes change, everything changes. What is the pricing process? If the production of a product requires two or more absolutely specific factors, 
what would be the pricing process if all factors of production were specific? Hmm. This was one of the more confusing parts of the chapter. Yes. I was very confused by chapter three. They, or chap part three. He talked about, you know, producing good P with like three M and five N. I was totally lost. Yeah. I tried to listen to that several times and I just couldn't get it. I think I get the gist of it. It's so let's read the um summary here. When it comes to consumers, they purchase products so long as the units they acquire are valued more highly than the money they trade away. With entrepreneurs in the market for factors of production, the same is true. However, unlike consumers, they do not value their purchases for the direct utility they provide. On the contrary, the entrepreneur evaluates factors of production based on their appraisal of the products that these factors can create. Thus, subjective consumer valuations determine the prices of first-order goods, and then appraising entrepreneurs forecast these prices in order to guide their buying decisions, which lead to the formation of the prices of second, third, and higher-order goods. Hmm. Now I feel confused again, because it seems to be saying that thus the sub, uh, subjective consumer valuations, consumer valuations, like you mm -hmm. buying that guitar, determine the prices of first order goods. I think that makes sense. So like, in order for, to get the, the price of the guitar, yeah. uh, first need to get the price of the metal to make the strings. First need to get the price of all the factors that those things are on the market first and then uh, they combine to create this higher order product so the price of the guitar helps determine the price of the, the metal that goes into the strings that doesn't seem right no. the the price of the metal determine helps determine the price of the guitar right then in this case is it this the first order good? Because the sentence, I'll read it again. Thus, subjective consumer valuations determine the prices of the first order goods. Which would be the metal. I'm not sure, because... Yeah. Okay, and then appraising entrepreneurs forecast these prices in order to guide their buying decisions, which lead to the formation of the prices of the second, third, and higher order goods. What does that mean? Okay, so first order goods, and so we determine the prices of the first order goods. So we determine the metal, the price of the metal that go into the guitar. So now we know that prices the price of all the factors that it takes to make a guitar. Mm -hmm. An entrepreneur can now appraise and forecast these prices. So now we can forecast the price of the metal going forward. Um, and then it'll lead to their buying decision on whether maybe I should buy a bunch of metal to make guitars. Right, okay, that makes sense. So the guitar is $300, so you know you can't spend more than $300 making the guitar. Right. So you have to find the metal that's going to be this much, yeah. and you have to find the plastic that's going to be this much, and the right. factory that costs this much. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. All right, thank you for <laughs> For whatever reason, that was a tough hurdle for me. <laughs> Number four, cost accounting. What is meant by the law of increasing returns or decreasing costs? So, uh, economies of scale. Yes. You scale. Yes. If you can have more, your output can be, doesn't have to be proportional to the greater capital you invest. Right.
what would happen if all of the imperfectly divisible factors were utilized at less than full capacity. This was confusing to me. I didn't get it fully. What would if all of the imperfectly divisible factors? Okay, so an imperfectly divisible factor would be a car, because you can't divide a car. Yeah. So what would happen if a car would were utilize less full capacity? Uh, I would say overall costs would increase if we're accounted if if chapter is for cost accounting, mm -hmm. say that would result in an increase in the costs. Right. If it's not utilized at full capacity. It should be utilized at full capacity. Mm -hmm. What would the result be of an expansion of production? Theoretically, it would be an increase in costs as well to increase uh, or to expand production. Mm-hmm. What would happen when full utilization of the cap capacity of one of the perfectly divisible factors was attained? You would be maximizing profit. Hmm. Yeah, but just one. It, it just chose one of the imperfectly divisible factors. We, I guess I need a clarification on what in imperfectly divisible factor is. Well, that was no help. Hmm. Yeah. How do transportation costs relate to the prices of factors of production? Transportation is a factor of production. Yeah. It's a cost that must be borne to get a good market. Right. Moon rock is really expensive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why aren't fixed costs determined merely by technological reasoning? Hmm. Fixed costs determined by technological reasoning. I don't know, I feel like there's a simple answer to this question, but I do not know it. Um, ah, I see. Uh, we must remember that the entrepreneur is always for, uh, guided by forecasts of likely future prices. At any time, there is no fact of the matter of the cap capital value of a given inventory. What matters is not how much the firm paid for the inputs, but rather what the firm is likely to get when it sells the inventory in the future, and what the relevant interest rate will be in the interim. So, the answer to why aren't fixed costs determined merely by technological reasoning is um, because there's no fact of the capital value of the inventory. Okay. I would think. Yeah, that makes sense. You can, you can make an assessment of what the fixed costs are, but there's no scientific, technological, like, determination for what the fixed costs are. Right. Until you sell it. Yikes. Well, that was chapter 16, parts 1 through 4, a little difficult. Next is logical catalactics versus mathematical catalactics and monopoly prices.
<laughs> and it's a big section, so that should be good. Cool.